section. So, you know, the, the design of this talk is, is very broad. So I'm hopeful to only be speaking to you guys with slides for about 20 minutes. Um, the, the concept is to introduce the, the, you know, what Down syndrome regression disorder is, what the history of it is, and then really from there, talk about some of the exciting research that we're doing and some of the advances in therapeutics for this condition. I realize that, you know, if you're on this call, you either are probably concerned about symptoms for a loved one or just want to learn more about it. So when we do the q and I'm happy to go back to slides uh, during the presentation to review things or go over some of the images uh, or videos as well. Uh, so with that, I'll get started. Let me just pull up my screen so we can get everything shared. <clears throat> so this is me and this is where I work. Um, and from there, we'll jump straight into it. So the first question that I like to start with is what is regression? And I think that this is a term that gets thrown around a lot these days and it's not necessarily specific to anything. Uh, so regression just refers very simply to a loss of previously acquired developmental skills in any individual. You don't have to have Down syndrome for this. Some of these activities that are ones that we kind of keep an eye on are activities of daily living, toileting, dressing oneself, eating independently. We talk about language or the ability to communicate and then motor function as well. And these are all things that can kind of change and should pique our concern for uh, a developmental regression. A key feature here is that regression can be caused by many things. And when we historically look at this, it's been thought of to be primarily psychological or psychiatric um, because it's often uh, in association with some type of stressor. So a question that I get a lot is, is regression common? And I think that the short answer is, uh, we have no idea. Um, this is a condition where it didn't really even have a name until uh, the last decade. Uh, it was often getting diagnosed as late onset uh, autism spectrum disorder or early onset Alzheimer's disease, or getting diagnosed as a psychiatric condition. Currently, we think that it's a relatively rare uh, phenomenon, likely affecting less than 5% of all persons with Down syndrome. But I think the age is really important here. We're talking about individuals who are between 10 and 30, because under that age range, we start to be more concerned with things like autism. And over that age range is when we start to think about things like Alzheimer's disease. So what causes regression? And the, again, the answer is we don't know, but there's likely several different causes. Uh, we often see that this is temporally associated with some type of stress exposure, change in school, passing away of a loved one, move to a new home. Um, but in and of itself, that stressor is not one that we think necessarily provokes the illness, but could you know, set off a cascade of things that subsequently uh, causes the development of symptoms. Uh, remember, regression is a description of the symptoms as opposed to the actual cause. And we'll talk about some of the workup that we do for this on the latter part of this presentation, and then kind of explain why we have to do such a broad workup. Timing matters. Uh, what we care most about in neurology and neuroimmunology is if the symptoms are acute, very sudden, or subacute happening over a few weeks, or even, you know, like 12 to uh, 16 weeks, is kind of that time frame where we think about subacute regression. Things that are a little bit more chronic likely have other explanations as well. And again, that's where we kind of start looking at things like Alzheimer's and autism again. So I think this slide just highlights some of the proposed mechanisms for what regression is. There's immune causes, pain, genetic, stress, neurologic, psychiatric, environmental, nutritional, endocrine. I mean, the list goes on and on. And I think that when we look at regression, a key feature here is this is a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning that we ruled out the other causes of regression. And really what we're talking about today are these idiopathic cases or ones without a clear cause. So I'd like to talk about the symptoms. We're gonna go through three slides. Um, so the first one is, is often the one that brings people to medical attention is the mental status change or a behavioral change. This is a loved one who's suddenly becoming confused, disoriented in places that you wouldn't expect, inappropriate laughter or laughing at things that aren't even present. And then a, a major one here is being off in your own world. So these are individuals who are sitting there, they're alert, they'll attend to a noise if, if a door slams or something like that, but they're just not engaged in conversation. They seem to be preoccupied with other thoughts. We also see that there's some increased or decreased eating. So it will swing in one direction or the other, corresponding with a weight loss during that time. 
we also see that there's a cognitive decline. There's a uh, lack of interest in doing things that are around them. So many of our individuals with regression who previously liked certain shows or movies or singing will no longer want to do that or have any interest in it. A volition is a limited interest in initiating activities. So these are individuals where if you put them on the couch, they'll just stay on the couch. Um, and then we also see memory impairment and difficulty with specific recall or remembering things. Insomnia is a big piece of this too. Um, not that everybody with Down syndrome is a great sleeper, but this is a sudden onset of either severe insomnia or sleeping for over 16 hours a day. Um, we also see that individuals who can have this will have a reversal of their sleep patterns, meaning that they stay up all night and then sleep all during the day. Uh, developmental regression, again, as we talked about earlier, is really focused on the activities of daily living, but we also see that there's a big social withdrawal as part of this. So these are individuals who previously were very energetic, had friends, liked to do things with others, and now just basically sit in their room alone. Um, there's a loss of these of previously acquired developmental milestones. A lot of this specifically relates to language. There's decreased eye contact, there's rigidity around routines, and there's stereotypy, meaning repetitive motor behavior or stimming that you'll sometimes see in individuals with autism. The large reason why some of these features, if you looked at it just in isolation in this one grouping, you could say, okay, well, this does look like autism. Obviously, new focal neurologic deficits are things we want to know about. That's weakness on one side, facial asymmetry. These are things that we want to get evaluated immediately. And then a movement disorder, or a slowing specifically of how we move. Um, so catatonia is muscle stiffness um, or the inability to initiate motions because the muscles are so rigid. Bradykinesia is slow movements or freezing behavior. So this would be somebody who's walking and just gets stuck. Uh, or a gait disturbance or an ability to walk. And so the way that I kind of describe this is it, it's called a magnetic gait. It almost seems like the floor and the bottom of the shoe are magnets that are attracted to each other. So the shoe never really lifts that far off the ground. And it almost looks like you have a, the gait or the walk of somebody who is very elderly. Uh, expressive language defects are really prominent. So these are people, uh, loved ones and individuals who have pretty good vocabulary is useful sentences and all of a sudden start whispering and then eventually become mute. Um, there is a, uh, you know, in severe forms, a complete global aphasia, meaning that they can't really understand or express how they feel. We also see some individuals who retain language actually have these things called neologisms or using new or garbled words. The psychiatric symptoms can sometimes come out as well. We see anxiety, delusions, hallucinations, and this concept called derealization or depersonalization, where there's a belief that they're actually in a dream or in a video, movie, whatever it may be, and not in reality. Um, it's a very rare one. You usually have to retain enough language to actually describe it, but we've had a number of patients report that as well. We also see that obsessive compulsive tendencies that are new tend to get uh, tend to ramp up very quickly. And in our younger male patients specifically, we see some aggression and agitation. So our current understanding uh, is that persons with Down syndrome are at risk for a variety of different psychiatric, neurologic, and immune disorders. And regression can be caused by one or the one or several of these. And that's why we kind of do this broad workup is to figure out what the exact contributing factors is, uh, you know, are so that way we can go after them and then treat them appropriately. So psychiatric disease is well reported in persons with Down syndrome, uh, depression, anxiety, autism, attention deficit, you know, much higher rates than in neurotypical individuals. Um, it's complicated by the fact, you know, in terms of assessment, when you go and see a psychiatrist that many individuals with Down syndrome have intellectual disability and expression of the psychiatric disease can be very challenging. I think that, you know, one hypothesis that we've worked on for many, many years is that regression is triggered by psychiatric disease. And what we see is that individuals with regression do respond to antipsychotic medications. They do respond to antidepressant medications, but the response rates are often not full. And so that's something where if we kind of buy that this is primarily psychiatric, then it doesn't really, you know, roll with the incomplete response from the therapeutics. Individuals with Down syndrome are also at risk for a variety of neurologic disease. So as a neurologist, this is what we see in clinic quite a bit. Um, so the individuals with Down syndrome are at risk, basically 10x risk of developing seizures or epilepsy. 
um, dementia, again, this is this early onset Alzheimer's thought process, stroke, specifically from Moya Moya disease and mitochondrial diseases and sleep apnea. This is why we do some of the neurodiagnostic workups such as EEG, which is a non-invasive test um, that looks at brain activity. Uh, we also use MRI, which looks at the structure of the brain and then a spinal tap or sometimes called a lumbar puncture. As you look at there's inflammation, infection or a metabolic disturbance within the brain itself. The reason why lumbar puncture is actually utilized is that the brain is protected from the body by a very thick barrier. The same reason why every time you get sick with a virus, you don't get meningitis as this barrier keeps everything out. So to really assess what's going on in the brain, we have to bypass that barrier with a needle. And that's why the, the spinal tap is uh, a very important part of the workup for this. Um, as a neuroimmunologist, I'm a little bit biased. I, I think that there is probably a cause of regression associated with inflammation. And we know this because individuals with Down syndrome are already predisposed to a variety of autoimmune diseases and dysregulated immune responses related to their upregulation of interferon, which is encoded on chromosome 21. And now we have very strong data to support that IBIG and other immune therapies actually very much help this condition and are likely tied neck and neck with some of our other medicines as being some of the highest efficacy treatments. We use the term autoimmune encephalitis a lot in neurology. Um, I think that this is what we've kind of been using to get medications approved and to get other physicians to understand the workup of what is being done for individuals with regression. But I do think that the phenomenon that we're seeing is not actually autoimmune encephalitis, that we're seeing something that phenotypically, meaning by symptoms looks similar, but the cause is very likely to be quite different. Immune dysfunction and endocrine dysfunction in the body can also mimic these symptoms as well. We know that individuals with Down syndrome are at risk for thyroid disease, celiac disease, rheumatologic disease, diabetes. All of these are really important to rule out with your doctor. And thankfully, a lot of this can just be done from the blood. Just because you have an extra copy of chromosome 21 doesn't mean that you can't have another gene uh, that is abnormal. This is some of the research that we're doing right now to actually determine if there are specific uh, additional genetic uh, abnormalities that could be predisposing individuals with Down syndrome to get regression. Because as we've seen, most people do not, most people with Down syndrome do not get this condition. So we wanna try, try to figure out why there is a predilection for individuals to get it or not. Uh, nutritional deficiencies can be common, especially for, for those of you uh, who have loved ones who are picky eaters. Um, so testing vitamins is another easy thing to do from the blood. We have not had too many patients come back with nutritional deficiencies that clearly explain this, but things like B1, B12, vitamin D, even vitamin E can mimic some of these neurologic symptoms and can, are very easy to check and then replace. So how do we make the diagnosis? We've kind of hinted at this. Blood work helps us with ruling out GI-related issues, metabolic issues, nutritional, infectious, and some inflammatory disorders, and it's the easiest. Most, most loved ones that you, uh, you know, uh, with Down syndrome have had routine blood work many, many times in their lives, so it's the least invasive of all these studies. Uh, and EEG, good jumping down to that third block, is also non-invasive. We just apply uh, a little electrode watch the brain activity for an hour. We're really not looking for seizure, although it does help rule that out, um, but we're looking for slowing of the brain activity. This EEG is most helpful when you've had one from before your regression, but obviously not everybody has an EEG. So it's difficult to interpret because there is a high rate of abnormal EEGs in persons with Down syndrome that are not related to regression or epilepsy. It's just kind of a, a, a finding that we observe. MRI helps us look at the anatomy. I, we realize that most patients have to be put to sleep for this one, which is unfortunate. Um, but this is a really important test because it helps rule out inflammation and stroke as well as structural causes. Um, so I will say of the <clears throat> 200 patients we've evaluated so far uh, with regression, we've caught three patients who have actually been having strokes and did not have the classic signs and symptoms of this. And so this is why when we're kind of weighing that risk and benefit of a sedated MRI, we usually err on the side of getting it because the reversibility of um, finding things early is really significant. In addition, the last component is the lumbar puncture. 
Um, that's, uh, as we talked about, to bypass that blood-brain barrier. Uh, it's really important to check for inflammation from that standpoint because it's not information we can get from the blood, MRI, or EEG. So after we, we reach, the you know, reach the diagnosis, that's great. We have criteria for that. But then subsequently, we use all of the pooled data that we've used to kind of rule out other conditions to say this is consistent with regression, or actually it's the symptoms of regression, but the cause is B12 deficiency or epilepsy or psychiatric disease. A thing I want to stress is that we, we always want to encourage families um, to talk about regression and ask what they think you know, ask your doctors or treating, you know, uh, healthcare providers what they think the most likely cause of this is and what the next step is. Um, and if you're only getting partial or temporary results, it's okay to ask, should we do more testing or should we consider other options too? I think this is one of those things where because the disease is so poorly understood, a lot of things should be on the table and open for discussion. A, a stress point that I want to make too is that as a medical community, we're still learning the best ways to treat this condition. We have been lucky in terms of having a hot streak recently of getting a lot of good data to support the use of certain medicines versus you know, others, um, but the, the puzzle pieces are still out there and we're, we're learning as we go. So there is not one specific treatment for individuals with regression. Um, again, the source of the regression is going to be the best way to actually get the most effective treatments on, but there can be overlap between psychiatric, neurologic, and immunologic components, and that's why it's an important piece that, to understand that multiple different therapies may be tried in sequence or uh, overlapping as well. Finding a doctor with expertise in this or at least familiarity with the condition is, is also very helpful, and then obviously if that treating physician or if you're in an area where it is a little bit harder to get somebody who has seen or evaluated individuals with this condition, reaching out to other centers uh, who have is always very helpful. The treatment uh, for regression is very broad. And I think that this comes from our evolving understanding of what this disease is to begin with. So antidepressants, antipsychotics, and electroconvulsive therapy have all been used on the, under the auspice that this is a psychiatric disease. Immunotherapy has only been recently reported over the last probably three or four years to be highly effective in some individuals with regression. Cholinergic agents are, are medicines that we use to treat Alzheimer's disease, again, when, from when we thought that this was kind of an early onset form. And then benzodiazepines are used to treat catatonia or that muscle stiffness we were talking about a while ago. Um, all of these are going to be very tailored to the individual, but I did want to show a video of a family that we've uh, worked with who had provided a, basically a before when uh, the young lady was healthy, a video of the regression itself and actually after the immunotherapy that we started. And let me just make sure that I can share this well with everybody. Hey. Go away. I am now going to go to today. Yeah. Are you ready for another case of the movie? Huh? Are you? <laughs> Okay, so, you know, I think that that's, 
hopefully a helpful, you know, illustration of somebody who was going from talking and reading to not doing that kind of off in our own world and then thankfully regaining many of those skills uh, with immunotherapy after the uh, extensive workup was performed. I've included our direct line uh, for research. It's dsresearch at chla.usc.edu. It's our clinic number on the other side. Um, you know, we're again, happy to collaborate with, uh, with any doctors locally, even if it's on the East Coast. And, you know, I think that the other piece of this that I wanted to mention is that in the spring of this year, we will be opening up the first clinical trial for regression um, in, uh, for individuals with uh, Down syndrome. Uh, right now, we're probably looking at May of 2023, uh, but we're, we're very hopeful and very excited uh, to look at that. That'll be looking at lorazepam, which is Ativan, used for the treatment of catatonia, versus IVIG, which is a form of in, immunotherapy, versus a new medication uh, called tofacitinib, which is an immune suppressing medication that actually has been uh, uh, very helpful for treating a variety of autoimmune diseases in persons with Down syndrome. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing and I'm happy to take questions and uh, chat with the, with the group. Thank you. So I just want to remind everybody to go ahead and use the Q&A box and type your questions in there. And since I am actually moderating this, um, I'll ask the first question. Um, there's an, so many symptoms, but is there something we could be doing proactively to try to prevent some of this stuff? I know there's some families that have used some protocols because of the early onset Alzheimer's. Is there something that we could do similarly for the regressive disorder? Yeah, no, that, that's still unknown. I think that anything that we can really do that promotes health is not gonna be harmful, but I don't, thus far, I haven't found that any diet, nutritional supplementation has necessarily prevented it. But, you know, it's, I think we're also missing a lot of the individuals with this right now. I think there's a lot of people in the community who just have not been diagnosed with it. So once we get everybody under one house and we can do really comprehensive assessments, I'm hopeful that we'll find a cause and then be able to hopefully prevent it from happening in the first place. I guess that would be a good plug for um, the, the Down syndrome registry where people can um, include their family member with Down syndrome and any types of illnesses or diseases or medications, or I guess at this point, um, symptoms. Yes, and, and that, that's something where a lot of our data right now comes from single institutions and that limits our, our ability to detect what these rates are. I think that even when we look at chronic medical conditions like epilepsy, we actually don't really know how many people it affects because our centers have difficulty talking to each other. So that's kind of the plug for registries in general. So there are a few questions in the uh, Q&A box. I'll read the first one is, down syndrome regressive disorder, the same as Down syndrome disintegrative disorder? Yes. Um, so regression has been called many different things. It's, called been, it's been called Down syndrome disintegrative disorder, Down syndrome regression disorder, unexplained regression in Down syndrome, catatonic psychosis. I mean, it goes by many names. We, we submitted a consensus paper where we put all the medical experts together and it was agreed upon to use Down syndrome regression disorder. Disintegrative kind of had this permanent, you know, feeling and unexplained regression also didn't seem to fit because sometimes we do find the explanation. So for net right now, we're calling it DSRD. Another question, how prevalent is regression past 30 years or have you found that? Yeah. So there are a few patients that are in this gray area between 30 and 40. We normally think of 40 as the time where we start to see uh, Alzheimer's disease start on. We don't know what to do with those patients. So it's tough because I work at a children's hospital. And even though we see patients up to 30, there is this gap in between. Um, we, you know, we're collaborating with uh, you know, a few other institutions right now to kind of figure out if there is something different about that 30 to 40 crowd, but we don't know right now. It seems that there's less 
regression in that group on the whole, though. Our clustered age is really late teens to early 20s. Another question. You mentioned slowing on EEGs being common, but have you noticed spe specific differences on MRIs of people with DSDD beyond stroke, et cetera? And if so, what does that look like? Yeah, no, that's a, an excellent question. So we see um, that there's two findings that come up on the MRIs. One are T2 signal abnormalities that tend to be in the frontal and temporal lobes in the white matter. That's a lot of medical jargon, but it's something that gets reported on on the, on the MRI report. The other thing is we see that there is early mineralization or calcification of a part of the brain called the basal ganglia. And we think that this is an area that's probably involved in regression and also may be associated with early aging. And so the question I think for us is, is the immune system accelerating that or is this another cause? But when we see those findings on the MRI, there is a four times higher likelihood that those individuals will respond to immune-based treatments. So it is very important for us to find that information, even if we're not finding another cause for the regression like a stroke in that situation. Thank you. I'm going to follow that up with my own question. Um, before you mentioned the EEGs, where we don't usually have a baseline, is this something that is going to be recommended moving forward? Um, I know the adolescent guidelines have recently been updated and the adult care guidelines have recently been released and they're looking at more, but is this going to be another type of um, diagnostic tool we're using as a, with starting with a baseline? I don't think it's necessary as a baseline. I think that it is helpful in the acute period and it's most helpful when you have something to compare before, but because regression is so rare, the number of EEGs we would need to do to have something valuable is probably too high. So it's not a screening measure right now. Thank you. Um, another question, can it be confused with Alzheimer's as its symptoms show regression? Will it be hard to treat if it takes time to diagnose it? Uh, yes, it definitely can be confused with Alzheimer's. And we've had many patients who have had the diagnosis of early onset, or early onset Alzheimer's, but as a teenager, which never really made a lot of sense. Um, it, what we find is that you know, there isn't a treatment for Alzheimer's disease. So a lot of the diagnosis of early onset Alzheimer's was kind of not really with regards to treatment. But those are the cholinergic agents that I was uh, you know, talking about earlier in the presentation. They work in a small set of individuals, but it's not enough to say that this is really a degenerative process. And I think that what we're talking about with DSRD, the symptom onset is relatively quick. Um, whereas with dementia and Alzheimer's disease, it's very, very slow over many, many months to years in most situations. Thank you. Um... Does this disorder usually occur in young age? Um, so not really. I think that when we look at our population-based assessments, the youngest patients were really consistent with this diagnosis. We're in the kind of eight age range. So we don't really dip and make that diagnosis younger than that. That being said, we have evaluated a few patients where it's not clearly autism, that the regression was very rapid onset, but I think that that is the minority of individuals right now. So most of our patients are going to be teens to 20s. Thank you. Um, is obstructive apnea an accelerating factor? <laughs> Hard to know. I mean, pretty much everybody with Down syndrome has obstructive sleep apnea, so we don't think it's an accelerator, but it is an important thing to rule out. You know, we've had some patients where it, it did look like regression. And then we found that their, you know, apnea hypopnea index was through the roof and we treated them with CPAP and it helped, but that is a, a small minority of, of individuals. Another question. Do you find seizures are more common with DSRD? Uh, not really. So we find that seizures are really infrequent with regression. Um, but that's part of that workup. Whereas if we're seeing seizures or events that are concerning with seizures, we want to do an even longer EEG to really determine are the symptoms related to epilepsy or seizure disorders, or are they related to something else? And, uh, you know, it's, I think in our most recent paper, 
was about 10% of individuals had a seizure at some point, but it does not seem to be terribly common. Thank you. Next question. Can a person with DSRD have more mania-like symptoms, inappropriate laughing, unprovoked for long periods of time, hyperverbal, and not show full Catalonia symptoms? Yeah, so it's possible. So 75 percent of individuals with the regression will have the catatonia, but we do have some that are very aggressive, very manic, will hallucinate, laugh, um, and it's not that motor, you know, persistence type of state. So it's a, it's a smaller percentage, but, you know, there are some more like activated individuals per se. And what's interesting is there are some patients where we start the treatment for catatonia, we suppress the catatonia, and then we actually see what's going on under the surface, and it is very psychiatric and mania driven. So it's one of those things where the catatonia, if you don't have the muscle energy to actually do the inappropriate laughter and have the hyperfluency and mania, once you actually treat part of the condition, you can get the other part, and then we need to kind of reevaluate the, the treatment protocol too. Thank you. If it is not treated, can it correct itself or get better over time? We have seen some patients get better. Um, most kind of reach a nadir, so they reach kind of a bottom out pretty quickly, and then they'll make a slight improvement, but then things tend to plateau. And the, the key is with untreated cases, more often than not, they're not getting back to baseline at any point or really anywhere close to baseline. The, there are some patients who have dropped down, been treated, and then recover in full. The paper that we're you know, looking to publish right now is that with treatment, we've gotten about 50% of the patients back after a year and don't have to continue the treatment either. So there is a potential to actually reverse the course permanently if it's identified early and treated early, but we're still not there yet for knowing what the exact best treatment is up front. Thank you. Okay. What have your studies showed about steroid use, high or low dose, to improve DSRD symptoms? Yeah, so steroids are something we use all the time in neurology, all the time in medicine, because they kind of make everything better. What's interesting is we do have some individuals with regression who do respond to steroids, but it's only about 30%, which is much lower than many other diseases. Um, where we found the most success with immune treatments is actually with IVIG. The challenge with IVIG is it's expensive. It's an IV infusion, um, but we've used high dose steroids and low dose steroids, both with effect, but it's not for everybody. It's a smaller percentage than you would think would have the um, effectiveness on that one. Thank you. Okay. So if anyone has any more questions, if you'd please go ahead and get that in the box. So um, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the other research you're doing related to Down syndrome and other um, diseases or other, th other things that we're, we're not used to seeing? Yeah, so the... What I focus, is, focus on are the neurologic diseases in persons with Down syndrome. So I think at the early end of the age spectrum, we worry about infantile spasms, which are a seizure disorder happening around a year of age. Then we worry about kind of what is the autism spectrum disorder? Are we diagnosing it? Can we get the diagnosis so we can get extra resources? Regression tends to hit this middle group in between, um, but on both ends of the age spectrum, in, at least in pediatrics, so the very young and kind of the older teens, our other research is focused on the development of Moya Moya, uh, which is a cause of stroke in persons with Down syndrome. There's no way to screen for this right now. We are looking at a non-invasive technique where we basically put an ultrasound on the side of the head so it's non-invasive, it's not painful, and we don't have to sedate anyone for it to see if we can try to predict it um, before the symptoms come on. The challenge is, you know, when an individual with Down syndrome has Moya Moya, almost 80% of the time they present with the symptoms of the stroke already, so the damage is done, whereas in individuals without Down syndrome, that number is only about 40%. So we want to drive those numbers down so we can actually identify it, treat it, and then prevent the, the permanent neurologic symptoms. 
Thank you. A couple more questions here. Can you just briefly list symptoms to look out for? Yes. So the, the biggest ones that we see are insomnia out of the blue, so changes in sleep, all of a sudden having social withdrawal, so not wanting to do anything, not wanting to go outside, that muscle stiffness or the catatonia, where if you put an individual in a chair or something like that, they're not getting up and going anywhere. Um, being off in your own world for no reason and having difficulty with language. So that expressive language, all of a sudden you go from talking in full sentences and having a good vocabulary to barely being able to get a word out or whispering. And obviously the psychiatric symptoms are gonna be very straightforward to notice, but those are all ones that you wanna bring up with your doctor really as soon as they're coming up. There's not a reason to sit on it um, if you're concerned. Thank you. Can you circulate the paper you are writing when it is published? Absolutely, I would be happy to. We, we try to publish everything open access so you can actually Google the papers. So if you type in Santoro and then Down syndrome regression disorder, you should actually be able to log on and, and get everything for free and be able to print out the full PDFs. We are, we are full believers in having everything accessible to parents too. Well, thank you. Okay, I think we have a statement coming up here. I will try to articulate it properly as I read it for the first time. I feel a huge shift needs to take place with how medical doctors view regression with our population. Clearly, you are leading the way. Thank you. <laughs> and your research will eventually be commonplace, but it is in between area that, I'm sorry, commonplace, but in this in-between area, what is the best way to get doctors to take our concerns seriously rather than just blaming symptoms on Down syndrome? This happens all too frequently and it can feel very isolating for our families. We are very thankful for the research you're doing. Exclamation point, exclamation point. All right, well, uh, Sarah, I think you're, you're hitting it on the head right here is that you know, ultimately, this is not doctors trying to be jerks. This is not people really even ignoring, you know, what's going on. I think the biggest challenge is we don't know what we don't know, right? And I think that really until a couple of years ago, um, regression in Down syndrome was really consistently thought to be early onset Alzheimer's or, or autism, both conditions we can't do anything for. So it, it resulted in this application of these are two things that we know happen in persons with Down syndrome, but we don't have a treatment for it. So when you were showing up in between, it was like, mm, you have this and there's not a good therapy for it. So just go home. And it was very dismissive. And I don't think that that was purposeful. I don't think anyone was sitting around thinking like, how can we, you know, ignore these families who have children with concerns. But I think that it comes from the model with which we think it. Um, I think that sooner rather than later, I'm hopeful that this will be commonplace. The ways that I recommend families go into uh, evaluations is, is almost like a business meeting. You need to come prepared and you need to know what you wanna say. Cause a doctor may only get 45 to 60 minutes with you on a, on a good day for a, a new patient consultation. So I recommend that families write up their symptoms, put it in bullet point form. So you know, here's the time frame. Here's what we notice first. Here's what we notice second. Here's the other factors that are around it, because that is something that you can read off of to the doctor and it helps keep you centered for the story. Because when many families go into the initial appointments, it's like the doctor goes, well, what can I help you with? And all of a sudden we're regurgitating 5 billion things and it can come across as very disorganized. I think the other thing that is helpful and is important is show me videos. Show me a video of your loved one doing something fun. I, find, I ask everybody to show me um, birthday videos or family reunion videos, things that are going to show people at their happiness and doing things. And then I have the patient in front of me. It's very hard when you're meeting a patient for the first time to know what they were able to do before, but I think videos are a fantastic way um, to show that. I think one of the other things that is helpful is now that we're kind of on the back end of COVID and we're allowing more people to come to doctor's visits, Bring a sibling, bring a cousin, bring somebody who knows your loved one very well, who can give a, you know, kind of non-biased opinion on, on what so-and-so is able to do now versus later. But I think going prepared, uh, bringing resources, print out the articles that we've written, and you can just hand them to your doctor or email them in advance. We also have a, a, a document called Quick Facts that we made that is for families 
It's available on the Down Syndrome Medical Interest Group uh, page or DISMIG uh, page. If you type in DISMIG and regression, it's like a PDF document that you can print off and use as a communication tool with your doctors as well. But it's hard and we're in the early stages of it, but I think that my hope is that we can kind of carve this out to at least explain that it's a different entity as a, you know, and it needs to be looked at a little bit differently than in other diseases. Thank you. Um, so as the advocacy and outreach director, um, I want to reiterate what you just said about going into your appointments prepared, but I, I don't want you to be adamant, but you do need to be assertive when you're dealing with your um, healthcare providers, um, because like Dr. Santoro said, it's to no fault of their own. So it, it is coming to, or it has been noticed, and we are trying to find a way to make sure that people with Down syndrome and other intellectual and developmental disabilities are having their healthcare needs met. And the models are being that instead of having every healthcare provider well-versed with Down syndrome and the diseases and illnesses that they may experience is that the resources are readily available to them. Um, and this is something we're, um, a lot of states are working on about having um, a medical home health, a medical health home. Um, and I know for those of you that are watching here in North Carolina, and if your child has Medicaid um, as a child or as an adult, we are supposed to be moving to the tailored plan, which is supposed to be making it again, more of a medical home for our families. Um, so that's another very important thing to do is try to stay up to date with the research and the other treatments that are available because you can bring these resources to your healthcare provider. Um, I, I think you know many of them are hungry for that information so they can treat their patients properly. Um, but without having those resources at their fingertips, it's hard for them to know where to go. Um, so I believe as parents, it's really important that we need to be on top of these things. Um, I'm, I'm not the science geek, the medical geek, um, but I, I can Google stuff. I could find the information and I could share it with my healthcare provider. Um, the other thing that I've been trying to look for, but, um, I've been looking on my phone. I believe um, Dr. Brian Chacoin is doing a webinar this week um, about the inequity of healthcare for people with Down syndrome. Um, and if I could find that, when I find that link, I can send that out to everybody um, tomorrow because I think it is coming up in the next day or two. And I'd like you to be able to know that that's out there. Um, but we do have another question. Can you provide that link to the PDF with the email of this video, please? Well, I've already written that note down, Dina. Thank you. <laughs> but yes, um, Dr. Santoro, if you um, can please, okay, I'm trying to do two things now. If you could please um, send me that link to the, the DISMIG list, that would be great. Let me come back in here. Where are we? Let me find you. Let me... <laughs> Okay. Sorry, I keep muting myself by accident. <laughs> so I'm trying to like finish one thing, but then you know, you know, scroll over to get to where the mute button is, and then trying not to end the webinar prematurely. So let's go back to where the questions are. Okay, yes, we are going to get the link to the PDF. Okay. So, and somebody put something in the chat box. Let me go in here. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> and I'm including the link uh, in the chat box right now for everybody for the, um, the quick facts document, um, which is that PDF that we authored um, uh, back in uh, uh, October of 2011. So it does need to be updated with some of the newer um, uh, data that's come out, but it's helpful at least as a document to kind of talk about with your doctors or use as a kind of a focal piece because it's written for families as a way to open up the discussion. Thank you. 
Okay, well, if that's it for the questions, um, I'd like to move on to the personal story. Um, so tonight we have um, Debbie, well, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Santoro for sharing his time and his expertise. Um, but wait a minute, we might have a couple more questions. Chat is disabled. Yes, chat is disabled, thank you. Um, all right, I'll try to get this correct. Is there any research involving Hooperzyne A? Does that sound correct? That, that, that does sound correct. Uh, so that is a supplement um, that's offered essentially over the counter. Uh, we've had many patients that have come in on this. We have not seen any dramatic effects. Um, I think that the challenge is, is many of the patients are on the huprazine are also on a variety of other supplements. So trying to determine what is having an effect versus what is not has been really challenging. Um, but, you know, with some of the supplements, you know, we're, we're California, we're free love. We want to try everything. Like if there is a diet or a supplement that is working, trust me, everybody will be the the first to know it. I don't like prescribing medicines if we don't have to, but we've not seen dramatic evidence of that or, or any of the supplements have really made a significant difference um, at this point. I'm glad you knew what I was talking about because I don't know how well I said that. Okay. Well, that does like look that does look like we're completed with the questions and answers. Again, I want to thank Dr. Santoro for his time and his expertise um, in bringing the sunny weather to us. Um, but I would like to um, move on to the personal story um, part of our evening, and this is presented by Debbie Levy, who is a certified teacher who works with students with intellectual disabilities. She's also a member of the board of directors of the Down Syndrome Network of Greater Greensboro. Debbie and her husband, David, live in Alamance County, North Carolina with their children, including her youngest, who is Rachel, who's aged 14. She has Down Syndrome. And Rachel was diagnosed with Down Syndrome Regressive Disorder in January of 2021. So we're going to get Debbie up here. Hi. Hi, Debbie. Thanks for joining. I can hear you. Thanks for okay. joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if Dr. Santoro is still on, but I, I also want to thank him so very much for uh, being so willing to participate tonight um, uh, and also uh, just the times that he has been there for me when I have reached out to him. Um, it is very much appreciative as a parent going through this um, and not always knowing where to turn um, or what to do and, and wanting the best for your child. Um, so I, I hope he knows how much he is appreciated and um, everything he's done and uh, for our family. So thank you, doctor. Um, I guess I'll get started. Uh, so basically my daughter, Rachel, um, who actually when I wrote up my little bio was 14, she's now 15. Um, she was a very typical teenager, um, healthy, very, very social, active, athletic, uh, a fantastic sleeper. Um, and very suddenly uh, in December of 2020, of course we were in the middle of the pandemic, um, Schools had been shut down uh, back in March uh, prior. And um, I actually had started homeschooling Rachel. Uh, so she was doing great with her homeschooling. Uh, very suddenly, like I said, in December, one night, I uh, went up to check on her. Uh, I tell her it was going to be time for bed. And she was very anxious, hysterically crying banging on her window in her room um, and telling someone by the name of Eleanor to go away. Um, of course, I was very taken aback. I didn't know what was happening, what was going on. Um, my main concern at that moment was to just calm her down um, 
and assure her that nobody was there. Uh, I noticed behaviors like that on and off uh, for about a week or so. Um, and then we came into Christmas and she seemed to be okay. Um, she made it through the, you know, the, the holiday and seemed to be doing okay. And I thought, oh, maybe that, I don't know what that was. Um, but then January, we uh, got back to homeschooling again, the first week of January. Uh, and the very first thing I noticed that was off was that she all of a sudden started to have a tremor uh, in her right hand, which she had never had before. So that was the first concern I had. Then the insomnia started. Um, we would go two to three nights with absolutely no sleep. Um, we would not sleep during the day. So full full 24 hour periods with, you know, 48 hour periods um, with no sleep. Um, during those periods, she would be in her room. She never really did try to go out of her room, uh, but she would be rocking in her bed. She would be pacing the room. She would be giggling. Um, no idea at what, but she would be randomly giggling. Um, some of the other things I noticed when we were um, doing her homeschooling would be if we were working on something and maybe I asked her a question, um, there would be a very long reaction or response time, uh, which was not normal for her. She had always had pr a pretty big vocabulary, um, sometimes had some intelligibility issues, but pretty much, you know, could speak full sentences and, and, and you know, a large vocabulary. Um, something else I noticed, she would just randomly stare off to the like wall to the side um, and I'd be looking and there would be nothing there, of course, and um, trying to get her back. Sometimes I honestly would have to snap my fingers to try to get her attention again. Um, if I asked her a question, I would get a blank stare. Uh, sometimes just very inappropriate laughing, as uh, just like Dr. Santoro mentioned. Um, so those are some of the things I noticed uh, that caused, you know, caused concern for me. Um, also, she was doing some whisper talking. Uh, and some, it's sometimes also even just whisper yelling, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, random phrases completely out of context. Uh, she would all of a sudden say something like, I learned my lesson as if she had done something wrong. Um, she would look at me and say, you're my mom, right? Uh, so all of these things combined, obviously, um, really had me concerned. I immediately contacted our local pediatrician um, who was very concerned as well and uh, who I'm so appreciative of to this day because she started doing a lot of research. She kept in touch with me. She was reaching out to other doctors if she didn't have um, answers to my questions. I also, um, we are here in North Carolina, like I said, and uh, we do go to Duke. Um, and Rachel, from when she was a baby, always went to the Down syndrome clinic there. I don't know if anybody on this Zoom um, attends there, but we went there for years back when Dr. Kishnani was uh, one of the doctors and we always saw her. Um, so I immediately reached out to her as well. Um, she hooked me up with one of the other doctors at the clinic um, and we had a video visit with her um, almost immediately. And um, I was very thankful for that because this doctor had a probably almost four month wait list to get, get an appointment with her. So I was very grateful uh, to be able to get in as quickly as we did. Um, and that was honestly the first time I had ever heard the words at this, at this point in time, they were referring to it here as Down syndrome disintegrative disorder. Um, and the doctor on the video call, the neurologist asked me, had you ever heard of this? And I was like, no, I've heard, you know, so many things with our kids. Oh, you might have a thyroid issue or your child might have a heart condition or, but never had heard those words. Um, and of course started Googling <laughs> like we all do. 
um, she had ordered blood work for Rachel and to go have an EEG. Um, we had those things and we were referred then to the Duke Autoimmune Brain Disease Clinic, um, which is at the Children's Hospital. And we met in February, again, very appreciative to get in so quickly and that the doctors were so on top of everything. Um, and we met with the team of doctors there. Uh, we saw a rheumatologist, a neurologist, and a psychiatrist. Um, and just like doctor suggested, we went in, I had my notes, I had videos, I had pictures, everything to show them how Rachel was before. Um, and all my notes documenting everything um, that had been going on with her. Um, at that point in time, they at first thought possibly she might have lupus. Um, and they told me that she was gonna have to have an MRI and a spinal tap to determine what was going on. Um, so we went and had those tests done. In the meantime, they also did prescribe um, medication for the hallucinations um, and the psychosis that was going on. And the medication they prescribed would also help with her insomnia, they told me. Um, we did go for these tests, um, but through all of this, while we were having the testing done and seeing the doctors, her symptoms of course con continued, her insomnia. Um, she did have some aggression at times um, where she would all of a sudden be pushing at me or her legs would be swinging at me, which was all not normal behavior for my daughter. Um, often I would refer to her behaviors or, or her symptoms. It, it would remind me of when you turn a light switch on and off. Um, one minute she could be whisper talking to me or aggressively telling me to get out of her room, you know, yelling at me, get out, get out, um, or refusing uh, to do something. And then the next minute, it would be like she was her happy self and very agreeable. Um, so it was very, you know, I always refer to it as a light switch. You know, one minute it's on and one minute it's off and you just didn't know uh, which behavior um, you were going to get. Um, we did have the, the testing done. Um, and that at that point they did decide um, that it, it was this Down syndrome regression disorder. Um, the cause they felt was psychiatric um, because it happened during COVID and Rachel being the social person she is and now being at home all the time and not having all the, you know, having her friends and her teachers and her regular sports and all of her different things that she did, that that's kind of what they feel triggered the onset of this. Um, they did also try a steroid infusion, um, which really didn't do anything. Uh, Rachel was not determined to um, have catatonia. Uh, she, they did the, there was like a trial they say, um, and she didn't, the doctor strongly felt that uh, that was not one of the symptoms that she had. Um, they did in March of 2021 prescribe us another medication. Um, and when that, once the effects of that started uh, working, then we did start noticing some improvements with her and started seeing her go back to herself and her sleep returning back to its normal patterns. Um, so by the end of April, 2021, I felt that she was really in a fantastic place. I mean, I felt like I had my child back because when you're going through this, you've, you honestly feel like you've lost your child because they're just not themselves. Um, and so I think at that point, I felt like she was actually back and I felt confident enough to send her back to school at that point so she could have her socialization again. Um, However, 
July of 2021, our symptoms started to return again. We don't know if it was because we were starting, they were trying to start to wean her off of one of the medications. We don't know if it was because it now was the summer and we were out of our usual routine of school, um, but the insomnia started again. Uh, the social withdrawal again, um, I did forget to mention that before she, uh, being such a social child and loving sports and all of that, during, through all this, she would want to just sit in her room. She wouldn't want to go anywhere. She had fears. Um, one of the times we had to go get blood work at Duke and she didn't want to get out of the car um, because she was fearful of the, Ill, of the illness or the sickness, as she said. Um, so that social withdrawal, um, she also in July kind of just started not eating as much and was losing weight. Um, and that was really hard. It was difficult. Uh, it was to the point where I wanted her to eat so badly that I would honestly run to Burger King or McDonald's just to get her food. So she would get something inside of her, um, she also started developing some new behaviors, um, which were uh, more artistic-like behaviors with the rocking and the flapping and humming that she hadn't done before. Um, so it was very difficult at this time when I thought we had been better and to now start regressing again. Um, we also had an instance at the end of November of 2021 where we were probably at a very low. Um, she was very confused out of it. Um, she would go to the stairs, look up the stairs, turn around and come back. Um, she would complain of feeling like she had to throw up. She would gag. She would spit. She would um, was totally not responsive and would not eat nor drink. And I knew at that point I had to take her to the ER. Um, I took her to the ER and it was determined that she was um, dehydrated uh, and they admitted us and um, again had to adjust her medication. Um, finally, through that, from the end of November, I would say probably till the beginning of February of 2022, um, she still had her symptoms on and off. But I would say by February, I finally started seeing, seeing signs of Rachel being back to her normal self. And she continued to get better. Um, today, I could say she's doing great. Um, we are still on the two medications. She loves school. She's active. She's uh, just finished up playing baseball. Uh, she does dance every week. Um, she will probably be playing basketball again. She's very social, loves being with her friends, um, loves, you know, going for walks. Uh, so, so we're really in a good place right now again, and she's, she's been doing great. Um, for me personally, as a parent on this journey, it has, you know, I, I will be honest with you, it's been very rough. Um, you know, you see your child withdraw and not be the happy, um, you know, even stubborn. You know, they say, we always joke our kids are stubborn, that extra chromosome. Um, and to have that now, I, I joke with my husband, I'll take it. I'll take the stubborn. <laughs> I'll take those behaviors again because it's Rachel and she's back. Um, so it, it, it was hard. Um, it was very difficult time and, you know, something that when I reached out to other people, nobody had ever heard about this. Um, so it's kind of been my mission through going through this um, is to try to let as many people in our community know about it and what to look for and um, to be able to have this Zoom um, to get, you know, the word out again. Um, you know, I feel, I feel grateful for this. Um, I do feel hopeful for Rachel. Uh, there is always that worry in the back of my head. Will we regress again? Um, what about if they decide they want to wean her off her medication again? What will happen? Um, but for right now, I, I, 
I just try to remain positive and I take each day as it comes. And, and uh, I feel grateful for where we are right now. I feel grateful for the wonderful doctors that I've had support us through this. Um, I feel very fortunate that I have a facility like Duke here where, um, you know, the doctors, Dr. Santoro knows some of the doctors that have treated Rachel. Um, Dr. Santoro uh, is part of a, a, a Facebook group that I was able to join because Rachel was going through this um, and he will, he will help anyone. So he has really been a wonderful resource as well. Um, so I, so I'm very grateful, uh, not just for our local pediatrician, but like I said, to just have a, f a facility so close like Duke, uh, that, you know, to have these doctors that were so quick to get us in, to get us diagnosed, to get us the, the, um, tests needed to diagnose her, um, and to just follow up with us. Um, we are, we have been released from the neurologist. We do still follow up with the rheumatologist. Um, Rachel did have some elevated uh, markers, um, autoimmune markers as well. Um, so that is something that they, you know, they are following up with. And we do follow up with the psychiatrist because of the medications um, that, she, that she is taking. Um, but that basically has been our journey. And um, if anybody, ever has any questions or if uh, you know you, you look me up on Facebook and want to message me I'm more than happy to answer any questions and thank you for having me well thank you Debbie if it's okay with you may I include your contact information in the follow-up email yes that would be great okay and um, I think you also said that you might have some resources that we might be able to include in that email as well. Yes. Thank you. Well, does anyone have any questions um, for Debbie at this time? You can go ahead and put those um, in the Q&A box. We'll just sit here for another minute. Um, I appreciate you being willing to share your story as well as having the fortitude to share it because you know it will help our community. No, thank you. It's, it's, I'm glad I made it through because usually I get emotional. So <laughs> I'm glad I can I made appreciate it through that. Without. <laughs> okay. Um, someone would like to know, do you mind sharing what medications they used? Oh, sure. Yes. Um, so for the hallucinations, they put Rachel on a Bilify. Um, we are, she is on a very low dose of it, um, but it, you know, over time was, uh, you know, kind of, we were up, we increased in the beginning, plateaued at a certain dose, then they had tried to start weaning us off. Um, and now we're, um, again, at a, a, a dose that we've been on for a while, and I think they're going to keep us on it for, for a while still. Uh, the other medication she's on is Lexapro. Thank you, Debbie. Okay. So just give it another 20 <laughs> seconds if anybody wants to type another question in there. Debbie, I have a question. Did you find that you had better access because of the pandemic and um, the, in, the use of telemedicine because of the pandemic? Um, I, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know if it was that or um, I, I, I kind of feel like I was fortunate because um, the only time we did a video visit was with the very first doctor. Um, and then we were able to go into Duke. Um, but I feel like I was fortunate to get everything moving along so quickly because of the fact that we had seen Dr. Kishnani at the Down Syndrome Clinic for so many years and she knew Rachel so well. And so when I started explaining to her what was going on, she knew, um, you know, that this was not Rachel and she had, I, I think Dr. Kishnani um, 
not I think I know Dr. Krishnani has also done some research on this. Um, if I'm correct, I believe she's also on one of the papers, one of the, re uh, like if you Google Down syndrome, uh, even if you Google Down syndrome disintegrative disorder, some papers, research papers will come up and she, her name is on uh, one of them. And so she has done some research, Dr. Worley, who used to be at the Down syndrome clinic, they, they have both done some. So I think that was um, probably, you know, more so where I was fortunate but that they knew of this and, you know, they knew that you, you know, it's, it's, it is important to get seen quickly and to get diagnosed so you could, um, you know, be treated. And, and I will also say that it, one of the uh, groups I'm on that Dr. S uh, Santoro is on uh, for regression, there, there are, I mean, sometimes I hate to say this, even though what I felt like we went through was horrific <laughs> at times um there are it, it's almost like anything else you know one child could be one way and another child might have worse symptoms or one child might have you know symptoms that aren't so bad so it's 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 almost like anything else um so you know but it's all very similar and uh it is treated you know just as dr santoro said there are different many different treatment options that they try and I, um, I've worn many hats over the last 21, almost 22 years as a parent of a child with Down syndrome. Um, one of them being, I used to be the volunteer parent um, advocate at the Duke Down syndrome clinic. And um, I can say from personal experience working at the clinic is that it is very important for you and your child to have an ongoing relationship with a healthcare provider, because especially at the clinic, um, a lot of families would come in until their child reached early adolescence, and then they would kind of stop coming in. And then as they hit those, you know, teen or preteen years, they'd come back in. And, you know, after three years, just technically speaking, you are no longer a patient of record. And a lot can change in that three-year period. And although they may only see your child once a year, um, they might be getting medical reports if you're having other things done. And if you're in the Duke system, they have access to all the records. So they do have a way to keep up with your child. Um, and that is even if, you know, if you don't have a Down syndrome clinic or you can't get to one, but you have regular appointments um, with your pediatrician and you're open with them about what goes on in the world of a parent and a child with Down syndrome so that they can be aware um, and know that when you come in that you are not kind of, you know, overreacting to certain situations um, if you don't have the documentation like you had. Um, there is another question for you, Debbie. Do you know if the Duke team has ever used IVIG in DS patients with non-psychiatric causes of regression? I can't give you a 100% answer, but I, I know um, Dr. Um, and I, I never remember if I'm saying her name correctly, but the rheumatologist, Dr. Van Matter, I know um, she knows about IVIG treatment. So I don't know um, whether they've done it or not. Obviously we did not have it um, because Rachel just came back so well with the medication. Um, but I do know she is aware of it, of the treatment of IVIG. Okay. And, um, Dr. Santoro, um, can answer that question as well. Um, and he should be unmuting himself. Yes. Uh, thank you. And, and Debbie, thank you for sharing your story, because I think a, an important thing to highlight is that this process is very isolating. And even though we're part of large Down syndrome networks, it's still rare amongst persons with Down syndrome. And I think the more integration that you know we can have, the more webinars we can have like this, Facebook groups, I mean, really, whatever is gonna get the word out to families so that they're also aware that this is an entity is so important. Um, you know, I, I work closely with the Duke group, uh, you know, way back in the day, I almost joined the team over there too. So it could have been a whole different landscape in, in North Carolina. Um, 
But uh, Dr. Ren Motter is, is very familiar with IVIG. Um, she's worked with us on a variety of different cases and, and also is on our consensus criteria and our, our new paper on um, IVIG, which we have in, uh, in submission right now. So I'm hopeful that that'll get published soon and be available to families. I think that the biggest challenge we find at CHLA, and I know this is a problem across the country, is getting the medication approved. And now we have one large study that we published in June on this, and I'm hopeful that this second one will make it so that it makes it an even easier process. But I still think you need to be with somebody who's familiar with it too. Like you don't want the community pediatrician doing your, your IVIG or immunotherapy maintenance. And that's where, you know, having access to great centers like Duke, you know, where uh, Dr. Van Matter does this day in, day out is really, really helpful too. Thank you for adding that. Okay, well, we're coming up on nine o'clock. So if we have any more questions for either Debbie or Dr. Santoro, if you could put those in the Q&A. I do wanna thank um, Debbie for sharing her personal story. Um, and I, I do know also, you know, being involved with the Down syndrome community, there are many cases where families feel very isolated um, when some form of a, something else comes up that most families don't experience. Um, I know, unfortunately, um, you know, the incidence rate of the dual diagnosis of Down syndrome and autism seems to be increasing as it does with the general population. Um, but, you know, some families, you know, you know, five, 10 years ago, they, they were isolated. They didn't feel like um, they had a community group and it is, you know, still hard. I know some families who, you know, when we're talking to them, they are, you know, they are not aware of what really the Down syndrome world is because the autism world has taken over for them. Um, so we, um, regardless of what our child's diagnosis is, um, I hope that we're all very supportive of each other. Um, so. Let's, let's, let's say thank you very much. I'm going to stop the